Hello, I'm Mike Buchanan, leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them. I'm joined today by Jan James, who heads up Good Egg Safety, a multi-award winning non-profit community interest company specializing in evidence-based behavioral change campaigns. The company works closely with the UK and Scottish governments, as well as with local authorities throughout Great Britain. Child protection features strongly in all the company's work and the organization extended its remit in 2019 to address the long-term psychological harm to children caused through parental alienation, the deliberate severance of the parent-child attachment bond with a safe parent. Research into the issue evidenced repeated breaches of official court orders and suicide ideation and mental health issues among victim parents from a robust UK sample of over 1,500 people. The data was analysed independently by a lead academic and a child psychologist. Further research conducted in partnership with a former member of the Scottish Youth Parliament among Scottish children and young adults between 12 and 14 years of age uncovered further alarming findings. These young people's human rights to family life, enshrined in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, UNCRC Article 12, had been systematically breached. A quarter of respondents stated that they'd had to, had to tell the parents they didn't love them in order to keep their other parent happy. Good Egg is working in partnership with, lead, with leading experts from multidisciplines across the world to raise awareness of this urgent child protection and domestic abuse issue. Jan, finally, a very warm welcome. Thank you, Mike. Um, we, we, we'll start with a couple of videos you made. Uh, perhaps you could just say a few words to introduce them. Thank you. So um, we started working on parental alienation a few years ago. I had no idea what it was uh, until I'd watched it myself for a few years in an unconnected family. And um, what was important was to help people understand, firstly, what it is we're talking about. Many people suffer, tens of thousands suffer from it, but don't actually know what it looks like. And it was during the time when we had debates through uh, in the um, parliamentary debates in the House of Lords, House of Commons, that we wanted to express what it actually is. So we used quotes in, in the first uh, film with, um, you know, from the former chief exec of Kafkas, from our attorney general, Suella Braverman, from the leading expert in domestic abuse, Erin Pitsy, who set up mm -hmm. the first refuge and was founder of Refuge, and also from uh, people who will know Joe Frost's super nanny, you know, who is a global parenting expert. So we've used quotes from them, quotes from parents uh, and, you know, alienated grandparents. So this film is really just a four minute overview of what it looks like. And it's followed by um, a somewhat longer video, Jan. Yes, uh, we were invited to speak at the Ministry of Justice in Brussels, and I wanted to introduce a film that we recorded with a bereaved father who was alienated, where no one believed him when he said that he himself was the victim of domestic abuse and who suffered the consequence of this gendered, false gendered narrative with the death of his son. So I talk about what effect dangerous propaganda can have on the lives of citizens and then introduce the film with Matthew Spriggs, the hardest film we've ever had to film. Oh, I'll bet. Jan, th Jan thanks, thanks for that introduction. So the, the, these videos combined, I think, are, are somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes. So I look forward to returning shortly.
It was not that long ago that citizens living in first world countries were persuaded that tobacco inhalation was not only not dangerous to their health, but was in fact healthy. This pervasive disinformation resulted in chronic ill health and incalculable deaths for millions of people around the world. We may ask ourselves how it was even allowed to happen, yet the reality is it was led by the powerful and influential tobacco industry and was a hugely lucrative business worth millions, if not billions in profits, so paid dividends to promote falsehood. Vested interests superseded the health and well-being of people to their collective long-term detriment. The use of their own industry doctors willing to sell their soul and profession for their 10 pieces of silver embedded this false narrative. It was effective because most people only look at the headlines and few beyond it. Because medical experts were wheeled out to perpetuate the illusion, people thought it must be true. But it wasn't true. It was dangerous propaganda which destroyed lives. We now face another wholesale propaganda campaign which is destroying countless lives and perpetuated by vested financial and ideological interest groups. So-called experts are being wheeled out to convince us of a false narrative and many people, including our governments, are falling for it hook, line and sinker. In this instance, it starts with a proposition that domestic abuse is a gendered crime a crime committed overwhelmingly against female victims by male perpetrators. This false assertion has been challenged twice by the UK Statistics Authority based on factual evidence, ONS and police data, yet the sensationalist headlines continue unabated. The legendary Erin Pitsey, a global expert in domestic abuse and founder of Refuge, the first in the world was ostracised and ejected from the very organisation she set up for daring to speak this truth, which was that out of the first 100 women who came through their refuge doors, 62 were as violent, if not more violent, than the men they'd left behind. She and her team had to pin little notes on the children to remind their mothers not to beat them when angered. By stating her simple truth, this amazingly courageous and compassionate woman received multiple death threats. Her dog was killed. She was forced to flee the country. Despite her many years saving countless women and children, her incredible legacy and immeasurable contribution to our society has been deliberately smeared and tarnished, libelled and defamed, truth and goodness extinguished. Erin understood this simple fact. Abuse is transgenerational. Those who grow up in violent and dysfunctional households are themselves at risk of becoming either victims or perpetrators. Without therapeutic intervention, the cycle of abuse continues. Tragically, the female perpetrator support units that she set up to help female abusers were immediately shut down when the new CEO took over the reins because female per perpetrator support units didn't fit the narrative that women should only ever be seen as victims, never as perpetrators. Tragically, for the almost 800,000 male victims of domestic abuse in the UK and their children, the all-female victim narrative is now firmly embedded deep within our collective psyche. And part of this is to deny the reality of parental alienation. Why? Because it's more likely to affect fathers, since mothers are more likely to have the power and control of residency. 
Yet parental alienation is a non-gendered issue and the narrative which positions it only as a tool for abusive fathers to re-victimise protective mothers appears as compelling as that of the tobacco industry. Any who question it using facts and evidence can look forward to being attacked on social media. Even female survivors like myself, almost dying from life-threatening domestic abuse, yet understand it originated from mental health issues, not patriarchy, is still fair game for refusing to comply. It's no wonder most people remain silent, but within that silence is complicity. And those who promote falsehood in order to further their income, ideology, or usually both, are committing a crime against humanity itself. Their false narrative enables alienating parents to continue causing serious long-term psychological harm to their children, and paradoxically ongoing grief and trauma to alienated mothers too. Presumably their acceptable collateral damage in ensuring parental alienation is not included anywhere within our Domestic Abuse Act, despite being the most brutal form of post-separation abuse to ever befall a safe and loving parent. Have you ever listened to the tragic story of an adult who was forced to relinquish a much-loved parent as a child in order to keep their other parent happy? We have. It's uniquely heartbreaking. Nor is it rare, as suggested by the vocal parental alienation deniers, an independent survey was undertaken on our behalf by the former Deputy Convener for Equality and Human Rights among young people in the Scottish Youth Parliament. A quarter, a quarter of the respondents stated they'd had to tell one parent they did not love them in order to keep their other parent happy. And according to research by Public Health Wales, parental separation is the most common cause of adverse childhood experiences, commonly known as ACEs. Where the critical level of four or more ACEs applied, these children did not have the support of both their parents in 85% of cases. Yet in contrast, for children with no ACEs, 82% of them had the support of both parents. So facts clearly show that children need both safe parents. Tragically for many children in the UK, when their parents' relationship ends, this doesn't happen. In the turmoil of relationship breakdown, some parents' own emotional or psychological state blinds them to their children's needs. A parent's need for continual validation or revenge overrides their focus on the healthy, ongoing needs of their children. And the psychological manipulation of a child, which can quickly lead to the outright rejection of a previously warm, loving relationship with one of their parents, fractures a vital attachment bond and can create an emotional vortex many children never recover from. We've interviewed alienated children survivors and they all recount a similar and tragic story. As children, they were falsely told that other parents didn't love them, had abandoned them, had left them for a new family, was replacing them with a new baby. These and many other alienating comments made them feel worthless and unloved. They talked about the impact of this while growing up and often referenced years of therapy to overcome their trauma, which may have included suicide ideation, drug and alcohol abuse, low self-esteem, anger and frustration, extreme guilt for seemingly rejecting a safe and loving parent, and trust issues because a parent who they trusted had deceived them. The extreme ideological narrative is one which minimises the vital role of fathers, yet millennia of evolution, and more specifically, 10 years of robust research by the UK's leading evolutionary anthropologist, Dr Anna Makin from Oxford University, finds the attachment bond is as strong for fathers as it is for mothers. Evolution has invested heavily in shaping men to be fathers with measurable biological, neurological and physical changes which bond them closely to their children. They provide unique benefits that are of great value not only to their children but to our wider society. Having two safe parents is always in a child's best interest. Both offer a unique additional protective layer to keep their children safe as do the wider family of loving grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins on both sides. Yet many good fathers have had false allegations of abuse levelled against them. We can prove it. The Believe All Women mantra results in safe fathers, not only abusive ones, ejected from their family home and the lives of their children and threatened with jail if they so much as send a card to their own children in the interim. 
And the biggest problem with this default societal response, when two parents simultaneously claim abuse, it is the fathers who are always rejected. And on more than one occasion, on quite a few in fact, this has resulted in the death of their children because no one believed them. According to the serious case reviews, i.e. factual evidence from coroners, more children have actually been killed by mothers than biological fathers. Does this make mothers, like myself, more inherently dangerous to children? Of course not. Most parents of either gender would lay down their lives to protect their children. What it does, however, is shine a bright light on the positioning of safe fathers as a threat and hammers another nail literally into the coffins of innocent children who pay the price for this with their life. Here is one of them, told for the first time by one of the most loving and considerate fathers I've ever met. His story is the worst we've ever recorded. We've worked with many bereaved parents and their stories are always tragic. This one, this story, is beyond heartbreaking. He lost his child because no one believed him. When he warned them that his child was in danger, all the alienating behaviours he experienced affect tens of thousands of loving fathers and mothers throughout the UK and throughout the world. Yet Matthew, his family, and most especially, beautiful little Archie, were failed by authorities who had a statutory duty to protect them, yet failed. They are speaking out now to try to prevent it happening ever again. Because it's our collective duty and our moral responsibility to speak out against any narrative which harms people. We need to get our compassion and love and care back into our society. And we need to see parental alienation and the behaviours it represents retained in the guidance notes of our Domestic Abuse Act 2021. Anything less would be unforgivable. Thank you. She controlled who I saw, who I spoke to. She controlled when I saw my family, if I saw my family. I became nothing in this world and, and when Archie came along, he was my main priority. And he was the reason why I stayed with her because I didn't want him to grow up without me in his life. My name was on the birth certificate. Um, we had registered him and it was the happiest day of actually holding him and being there and knowing that this human being, this little vulnerable person, I, can, I was there to protect and my whole life changed. When he was born, because of her conditions, um, I was the main carer for Archie. Uh, she told me that I was not allowed to register at living at her address. I wasn't allowed to work. I, <laughs> she told me unless I earned over £40,000, then I would not be able to work because it would affect her benefits too much. I was not seeing my family. I was nothing at that time apart from there to serve and help Leslie and look after Archie keep him well, to keep him happy, to keep him healthy, to stimulate him, to be a dad and be there for my son. I did not leave. She threw me out. During that night, she seemed very nice. I thought, I've done something right, okay. She bought a big crate of cider and she had a drink or two with me and then she kept giving me more and more. Then all of a sudden, it changed. Uh, she tried to have an argument. Um, she started shouting. Archie started crying after I put him down. She got up, went upstairs. I picked up Archie to calm him down, to cuddle him, to comfort him. As soon as I held him, he cuddled to me and relaxed. Then I turned around and saw her with the baseball bat and she saw Archie and that's when she went back upstairs. I now know that she went upstairs to phone the police and to get me taken away. A police officer came to me 
told me to give them Archie. I explained that what happened to them, they still took him off me. They then told me to leave the area. It is a one-sided statement that was given to the police. It does feel like it was a setup. She allowed me contact and I was having a lot of contact up until the time when I removed my computer. And then all of a sudden she stopped the contact. It was almost overnight. I had a meeting with Kafka. There was allegations of domestic violence. I was subjected to having to prove that I wasn't. And once allegations have been made, for people to say, are they true or aren't they? One of the allegations was that I was an alcoholic, that I was a drug user. I had to have hair follicle samples and blood samples taken, and they all came back negative. Apart from my solicitor, I'd never had any involvement with CAFCAS, social services, the police, the school. None of them asked my side. The court proceedings ended up that Archie was to spend three days with me per week have overnight contact and be with me. I was overjoyed with that my son for approximately half the week was going to be with me. And those three days, every week, week in, week out, were special days because I, I had lost my son and he was back in my life. And we did so many things Every week we went swimming, every week we went to different tourist attractions, every week the smiles and happy memories being made. She didn't adhere to the court order, she breached it quite regularly and there seemed to be no repercussion for her. Archie quite often asked me, why don't I hate his mum? And. I would say, why would I hate your mum? And he would reply, well, mummy hates you, why don't you hate her? And my comment back to him would always be, me and mummy made you, and I love you, so how can I hate somebody that made you? She used to tell Archie there's a monster in her shed, and the monster was called Daddy. It is in documents which the council have produced, Archie is scared of the monster in the shed. It's clear that she is brainwashing him to hate me. There were several things which Archie would approach me about. He saw me as a secure person in his life that would protect him. And I tried my hardest to protect him. I reported what he had told me to social services, to the police, to the school. And it was just seemed to be falling on deaf ears. Since later on, I found that if I reported it, it would be put down as I'm being malicious. If Leslie reported them, it would be investigated. If she found out that I'd reported those concerns, there would be punishment for Archie and punishment for me. Even though we went together, she had this control where she threatened if I didn't follow her rules, then I would not see Archie. I started noticing some bruises in not regular places like um, under his armpit and on the inside of his legs. I asked him, uh, how did you get that bruise? And quite often he'd say, I ran into a door and mummy hit me. I took photos of them and it seemed to happen every week, different bruises in different areas appearing. He came to mind the one week and those bruises on the inside of his one leg and they looked equally spaced and 
almost like a handprint where somebody had clenched it. And I asked him how he got those. And he told me that mummy had held him upside down and shook him. Social services, when I told them about that, not interested. They don't look into individual reports. I don't believe that she truly loved Archie. I think that she had Archie as a way to make money. And when it came to the last court case, there was possibility that Archie would have been removed from her care, but my care, and she would have lost the child benefit and everything else. There were several letters that she wrote. They concluded that she had wrote them possibly two, three weeks before. Not, at the, not after she had murdered him. There was letters addressed to her, myself, to her two other children, to her on-off boyfriend, and to Archie. This isn't someone that accidentally killed their son. This is somebody that premeditated, murdered their son in cold blood. They murdered helpless young boy. They murdered a beautiful boy. All for their own selfish gain. It's changed my life forever. And the one, only one good thing that has come out of her, she can't hurt him anymore. She can't hurt him. And would you like to tell us um, why your company is working in the area of parental alienation? Yes, um, we are social marketers. So we run campaigns running, addressing many different issues from anti-drug driving, young drivers, domestic abuse, which is undoubtedly where parental alienation fits, um, rider safety, child seat safety, where we're the leading expert on child seats across the UK. And we have a particularly tight focus on child protection, keeping children safe in cars, in home, uh, and when they get a bit older, when they start to drive. And I got involved actually inadvertently with Parental Nation because I watched it for quite a few years. I watched it in horror. Um, I am a mother of three, I'm a granny of three. I didn't realize it was so astonishingly easy to manipulate children and make them terrified of a very loved parent. So I just got to a point where I felt I had to do something and I committed our brand, um, Good Egg Safety Nonprofit to addressing it. So we started about two, two and a half years ago um, bringing together leading experts around the world, because I am only a campaigner. I didn't come in as a PA expert, um, but I do my homework well. And we now work with 54 NGOs across 33 countries and five continents. And I'm blessed to work with some amazing people uh, in this space. You, you, you were telling me earlier, Jan, that um, your previous campaigns on things like um, uh, child seatbelts had had plenty of mainstream media coverage um, but you'd, you'd had little or none for your campaign on parental alienation. Why, why, why do you think that is? It's a question I've often asked on my social media posts. You know, we um, brought together a group of experts, including Erin. Erin uh, was our honoured guest. And we hired an independent researcher uh, who I've used for other campaigns to devise the questions. We ran it on our relatively innocuous child seat safety Facebook page. And we were absolutely inundated. It was actually quite shocking how many alienated fathers, alienated mothers, alienated grandparents, alienated aunts and uncles responded to that survey. We then asked a, a professor on our group who's a lead academic at a UK university and a leading child psychologist who's also an expert witness to interrogate the raw data. 
And so we didn't touch the data, they researched it, and that's what's now in our report. Um, and we issued a press release with the findings. Um, we used PR Newswire. Um, they needed all the evidence that we'd run this, and it was kosher. And it went, it reached a global audience of 48 million, and not one newspaper in the UK picked it up. Why? Because people are, they are either, they've been indoctrinated into believing that parental alienation is only a tool for abusive fathers, which is false, completely false. We work with many mothers too. Um, or um, they uh, are too frightened. And we've had a few uh, emails from journalists who said, look, don't blame us. If we put this out, we come under attack. Our children are stalked. I mean, horrendous stories. It is a toxic space. Well, so I've been I've been told by um, quite a prominent journalist on, on the Sunday Times, Jan, that if he so much as submitted um, an article showing sympathy towards men's rights activists or or challenging feminists, he would expect to be fired the same day and 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 never to work again. So it's easy to sort of complain about journalists being lazy and so on, but they have you know they have mortgages to pay and children to feed, you know, just um, just like the rest of us. So we're not living then in the free society that we believe no. that we are. I mean, I believe passionately in women's rights. I am a survivor of life-threatening abuse. Um, I'm told by all of those, like Jess Phillips, you know, I read a book, Women Need a Voice, and my voice has come out and we're silenced. So this isn't about women's rights at all. This is about a different agenda. We work with thousands of alienated mothers afflicted by exactly the same um, trauma as alienated fathers, and they are silenced. They sent, one of the group of mothers sent a recording to the House of Lords to be played. And the Domestic Abuse Commission, the Victims Commissioners, no one has agreed to meet them. In fact, they were labeled trolls. So these mothers have themselves been re-victimized. It's 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 really shocking, um, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll have time to to talk a bit more about about the media. But um, we 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 were very disappointed by a report just put out by the domestic abuse commissioner. Um, uh, I wonder if you if you'd perhaps like to to, to to talk about your understanding of 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 that and the background to it. I think it's very disappointing. I haven't read it uh, in its entirety. So I'm not going to say that I have, um, but it, I was directed to uh, page 25, where she um, states quite categorically that domestic abuse is a gender to crime. Um, you know, she makes some comment about, you she know. She even said, she's, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jan, but she even said it is helpful to consider it a gendered crime. Well, it's, it's helpful if you're a feminist. Um, and you're, you're earning a living out of maintaining this lie, but for the rest, it's a disaster for everyone else. Well, it isn't helpful at all. And, and as you'll see from my videos, it is that falsehood that ultimately led to the death of little Archie Spriggs, because no one believed that his father could be the victim of domestic abuse. Mm. And yet all the research shows us, I mean, as a marketer, we have to go with facts and evidence. We never take anything at face value. So we do our homework, because if we don't, we could write award-winning commercials that people talk about for years, but if it's the right solution to the wrong problem, it's destined for failure. And the fact is that 57% of domestic abuse is bi-directional for a start. And Erin Pitsy was the first to say from her own lived experience, that the first 100 women through her doors, 62 is violent or if not more violent, and the problem with us trying to disregard that is it puts children at risk. So our domestic abuse commissioner who has a safeguarding, statutory safeguarding position funded by taxpayers, including male taxpayers, to state that it's helpful to assume. That is the rhetoric that led directly to Archie Spriggs' death and many others. That is very dangerous. It is, it is, it, it is, it has been known to be the idea that domestic abuse or violence is a gendered issue has been known to be a, a lie for 50 years. I mean, since Erin Pitsy, at least, and all, all the evidence points, point, points, points in it not being one. So 
the Partner of Youth State of Knowledge Project 2013, uh, uh, I, I know you're aware of this, uh, Chad, um, close to 60% of um, straight couples in which there's violence, um, the violence is, uni is, sorry, is bi-directional. Sometimes the man starts, sometimes the woman starts. But in the 40% or so, where it's always in the same direction from the same partner to the same partner, it is more than twice as likely that the perpetrator is a woman mm -hmm. as the man, more than twice as likely. And yet here we have the, we, and yet, yeah, here we have the domestic abuse commissioner saying it's it's a it's a gendered issue but it's gendered in exactly the in exactly the opposite direction of of, of the truth it's 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 mind numbing and this this crap goes on decade after decade well it's very dangerous for children which is why we yes. speak out you know if you are a woman in a domestic abuse you know in a relationship you are more likely to suffer domestic abuse if you are in a same sex relationship and that is a fact, and facts matter when we're talking about protecting children. So it's right that people question. There is a sense of entitlement that is actually almost breathtaking, that they can put out false information, get it covered, and then that falsehood becomes truth. But it doesn't matter how many times you say a falsehood, it's still false. I have a quote and it, it, it inspires me really. It's lies may have speed, the truth is enduring and the facts will come out sooner, hopefully, but, and later. But there are, but, but there are, this I guess takes us back to journalism. Um, there are plenty of f radical feminist journalists, and Julie Bindle, I guess, is the most obvious one for me, um, um, who happens to be a lesbian. Um, and she has made it literally made a living out of presenting domestic violence as a male on female problem uniquely. I, I, I've, I don't think I've ever seen a sentence from her um, acknowledging that women can, sorry, that men um, um, you know, are victims in similar numbers or that lesbians are, are a particularly violent so, you know, group, 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 uh, group of people. But again, that's, this stuff has been known, been known for decades. We, I, I we... think... Sorry. Oh, sorry, Jane, come on. No, I, I think, you know, there are some who genuinely believe that and you need to look at their background. You know, um, maybe they themselves were abused as children. Maybe they were alienated from fathers. It, it's a fear response. This is a fear response because in all actuality, we don't need to take anything away from male victims in order to protect female victims. As a compassionate society who wants the best for all our people and particularly wants to protect all children, then we should have services to protect all. But I do believe that now the Domestic Abuse Commissioner has shown her gendered nature that she should be renamed the Domestic Abuse Commissioner for Women. And I'm sure she'd be a brilliant one. And we need an alternative for men because we're not gonna get the services that we need to protect male victims. And the reason this is so critical is the almost 800,000 male victims means that their children are unprotected and that is unforgivable. So we absolutely have to have support for all victims. And what she said there nails her colors to the mast very clearly. Indeed, well, I mean, she, she wouldn't, I mean, knowing the subject as I do now, there is no way that um, a, a non-ideologically driven person could be in that position. It was it would be absolutely inc inconceivable. Can you imagine a domestic abuse commissioner actually telling the truth about domestic abuse? It's it's just it's not going it's not going to happen. Um, st st staying staying or just going back to the issue of the of, of, of the media, the Spectator um, in, in uh, uh, the, the the UK editor of the Spectator, of the, I should say the editor of the UK edition um, is is a woman, uh, and uh, she she point blank refused to accept um, a paid advert. It would have been about 7,000 pounds for, 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 for one full page ad in one edition, um, which was basically out outlining the data, the, the, you know, the, the, the findings of the research on domestic abuse going back decades. And, and yet this is, a, this, is a, this is a weekly paper which has, has commissioned Julie Bindle to write over 50 pieces. Their assistant editor, Isabel Hardman, 
um, writes writes nonsense like you know the the overwhelming majority of victims of domestic violence are women, and perpetrators men. They they, they, they and the reason they, they can get away with it is that how do you hold, you know, how do you hold them accountable if the entire mainstream media mm. is is you know is in the grip of this fear? Mm. How, how do you get through that? And I honestly I don't have an answer to that. Mm. Um, perhaps per, per, we'll have billboards. Um, at, at the next election. I think that the film, um, you know, my brief piece to camera and, you know, Matthew Spriggs' story, you know, is people need to see that. He is an amazing man. I spent quite some time with him. We spent a whole day filming. We're looking to do a documentary next year, which we hope to get on Netflix. And the thing that really struck me was not only is he a fantastic husband and father, his wife told us that he was the complete opposite to how he was presented by his ex-partner Leslie Speed, but also that he showed compassion for his ex, even though she killed his child. He said, you know, she too is a victim. And I think the biggest issue here is that this is not about um, removing rights for women. When we try and protect male victims, we're protecting their children too and many of those are girls. So if we don't protect children, we are setting up more problems for women. When we ignore parental alienation, we are disregarding many alienated mothers. Um, and when we don't look at female perpetration, we are not finding out the root cause and able to find solutions. Unless we understand what the real problem is, we can't come up with the right solution. And so Erin Pitsy, with, you know, who led with great compassion and oozes integrity out of every pore, set up a female perpetrator support unit within her homes. And it was the very first action that Carol Hawley took when she took over the reins. She shut them all down because they didn't fit with the narrative that women can only be victims. And I think that's really sad. Because with every abuser, there is generally an abused child or some kind of trauma. And unless we understand what that is, we can't address it for future generations. Uh, so I, we're not yes, helping uh, them uh, at all. I, I agree, Jan, but to the radical feminists who, who run this in the domestic abuse industry and they have 50 years, they, they, couldn't, get, they couldn't care a jot about women and children any more than they care about children. Okay. Um, so we, we produced two reports uh we produced these unfunded the first one uh was our parental nation study guide where we um, worked with uh, an independent research company uh, lead academic professor and child psychologist to interrogate the data with 2000 responses 1500 from the uk this is available on our website parentalnationuk.info and it's also on amazon and since then, we've also written a 108 page survival guide just to help parents working with experts around the world on how to identify current alienation, um, the red flags to look out for, how to handle yourself when you go to court. Um, it just gives every bit of information that I wish I'd known when I first came across current alienation in my own um, life. Jan, thank you very much for a most interesting uh, in interview. Um, I have a copy of this uh, of this guide, and it is so it is just sensational. You know, I hope plenty of people buy it. Thank you. Um, thank, th thank you for your time. Thank you for the amazing work that you're doing in the really super important area of parental alienation. And it's a wrap. Thank you. Real pleasure to speak with you, Mike. Thank you, Jan. You take care. You too.